This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk about Bitcoin and something called an evil made attack. And that's actually what it's called in the literature. An evil made attack is just an attack on an unattended device, usually a laptop, a desktop, a hardware wallet in the case of Bitcoin, in which an attacker with physical access alters it in some undetectable way so that they can later access the device or the data on it. I'm going to be talking about this, as I said, in particular with relationship to Bitcoin hardware wallets like the Trezor wallet. You can see in the picture here, uh, this is what this is what they look like. They're very small handheld devices that are used to hold your Bitcoin private key. They don't actually hold Bitcoin. They they hold your private key in a secure manner. So this would be an evil made attack on your Trezor or cold card or ledger or other a hardware wallet device. Let's say you leave your treasure, your hardware wallet in a drawer in your hotel room at a conference, maybe at Bitcoin 2022. Now it's obvious to anyone who is spying on you or trying to track you down or trying to see if you have any Bitcoin. It's obviously it's obvious that you probably own some Bitcoin because you came to a Bitcoin conference in the first place and you have a hardware wallet, which you just left in a drawer at your hotel room when you went downstairs. Now the evil maid could be working for herself. She herself could be the thief, or she could be just a hotel housekeeper who's being bribed in order to help the actual thief. So what the evil maid would do would be to take your treasure and replace it with a fake treasure that looks exactly the same. And then that fake treasure maybe would have an internet connection which would relay your PIN code to her when you enter it. A PIN code is just an external security device it's just like almost like putting your password in into a laptop or desktop before it starts up. You enter a numerical pin into your treasure and then that opens you opens it up and allows you to use it. But if someone replaced that, if an evil maid replaced that with a fake treasure, they could end up uh, sending your pin. You enter it on the on the fake treasure. Something's wrong. You don't it, you don't get in or maybe it lets you in. But either way, it, it broadcasts your pin to the evil maid or her boss. And she now has your original treasure and the pin so she can use it to sign a transaction. She can use the pin to get into the treasure. Then she can plug that into her computer and use that uh, because she now has access, move that to move, uh, use that to move your Bitcoin from the, the address where your Bitcoin is sitting to an address that she or her boss controls. If you're finding this video helpful so far, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Maybe share this video as well with a few friends. So that's one type of evil made attack. Here would be another one. This would be one that's more in the in the supply chain. You buy a treasure from a third party seller on Amazon, or maybe you buy it used from someone on Amazon or eBay, and that someone has modified it to transmit your private keys, your recovery seed to them after you generate it. Normally these private keys are generated locally by the hardware wallet. People at Trezor cannot see it, for example. We know this because the code is open source. Anyone can read the Trezor firmware code and see what's going on. But if someone has modified the Trezor, it may either transmit your private keys that have been freshly generated, or the Trezor might even come preloaded if someone has messed around with it. Uh, preloaded with a private key that the attacker already knows, but then that that the the hardware wallet that the treasure is serving up to you as if it's a new private key. And so then all the person needs to do is watch the addresses associated with the XPUB and see if any Bitcoin goes there. Then they have the uh, they either have your private key which was transmitted to them, or they have uh, they know what it is because it was it was preloaded with a private key. Now, one way of preventing this, obviously, is never buy your your Trezor or other hardware wallet from anyone except for from the, the actual uh, company itself. Um, also, Trezors come with a tamper-evident hologram either on the box or on the uh, on the Trezor uh, on the Trezor itself. The Model T actually has a holographic holographic seal on the Trezor itself. So you want to make sure that that hasn't been tampered with. One of the things about the Trezors, they come uh, when when you get them on your computer, you preload, or when you connect them to your computer, I should say, you load up the firmware. So they do come, uh, they do come sort of blank. And if if the firmware is already uh, uh, has already been loaded onto your treasure, and you see that when you plug it into the USB port of your computer, you definitely don't want to use it. And there's a treasure, there's a treasure warning that will also remind you of that. Now I should say none of this is a reason not to use a hardware wallet. Everything in life has these trade-offs. 
Leaving your Bitcoin on an exchange is a far worse move because you can be certain that the exchange will not let you have your Bitcoin back if there is ever an, a real emergency or a real crisis or a government crackdown or something like this, maybe even a supply shortage where the exchange pretended they had a certain amount of Bitcoin, everyone withdraws it at the same time and there's not enough Bitcoin to go around. So it's still, I think, a much better idea to keep your, to store your private keys on a hardware wallet. As we always say, not your keys, not your coins, not your keys, not your Bitcoins. For those of you who don't know what it is, when you set up a hardware wallet like a Trezor, it will generate a recovery seed, often called a mnemonic phrase as well, and this is a representation, sort of a human-friendly, readable representation of your private keys. And it's usually 12 words or 24 words. Um, and it's, it's common English words, or I think this is available in a few, a few different common languages. But this would be an example of a recovery seed. In this case, I'm just using kind of the selling one. I'm using bacon for all of them. There is something special about the way these recovery seeds work, whereas there's something called a checksum, where there's a calculation done on the first 11 words, and that's used to, to make sure that the 12th word is the correct word. In this case, it turns out that bacon bacon works in this way. So this would be this would be a backup of my Bitcoin. Obviously, it's not. I don't store any Bitcoin here. I haven't even checked it to see if there is any Bitcoin here. Probably not. It would have been swept already. But this is an example of a 12-word recovery seed. If someone has this, and if this is the corresponding recovery seed and private key to that particular Bitcoin address, you can use it to, to, to take their Bitcoin. This is really a representation of their Bitcoin. In other words, as I said, it's a human readable representation of the private keys, which are the only thing that can unlock the Bitcoin that is attached to a particular public BTC address. But you don't even need to know that address because it can be figured out from these private keys. So if someone is able to get a, a hold of your 12 words or 24 words, they have your Bitcoin. Again, hardware wallets do not store your Bitcoin. They store your private keys safely in a, in, a, in a secure element offline. They never touch the internet. They are used to sign transactions. Uh, the transactions are sort of sent inside the hardware wallet. So the hardware wallet and its private keys never touch the internet. Again, your Bitcoin's not stored anywhere. It's really just a, an entry on this digital ledger that we, that we call the Bitcoin blockchain. But your private keys is really what's being stored on a hardware wallet. When you first set up a hardware wallet, as we said, it generates a 12 or 24 word recovery seed. This is, this is what you should do. You should write that down on a piece of paper, make sure there's no cameras uh, uh, available watching you, uh, make sure your own desktop or laptop cameras has tape over it. Never do this in a, in a public place either because those 12 or 24 words are your Bitcoin. They are your ownership of your Bitcoin. So after you set up your hardware wallet, maybe your treasure, your cold card, and you generate this recovery seed, move a small amount of Bitcoin to an address at that wallet, and then take your recovery seed. This is the really best practices. Take that recovery seed and put it into a completely different hardware wallet. So maybe you buy a treasure, you move some Bitcoin on there, you uh, create a backup by generating a 12 word seed, then take that 12 word seed and put it into a ledger or a cold card and see if that same amount of Bitcoin shows up. And you definitely wanna to try to do this using a hardware wallet from a different vendor. And then make sure that your Bitcoin shows up in that second wallet, it's sort of a test. And then once once that happens, you can be sure that, the, um, that you have the correct recovery scene and you can be comfortable moving larger amounts of Bitcoin onto that initial wallet. Now, the other thing you can do is after you've moved the Bitcoin onto that wallet, or, or to an address, in other words, that's associated with the private keys held by the wallet, you can wipe both the hardware wallets and you can just store your recovery seed. If you're not gonna do a lot of transactions, this will save you the trouble of having to having to store that treasure or other hardware wallet in a safe place and protect it from hardware, uh, protect it from evil made attacks, I should say. The recovery seed, the 12 or 24 word phrase should never ever be stored online, in the cloud, on Evernote, in a, in a Gmail, in a Google Drive, or, or anywhere online. And never even take a picture of it uh, because if someone scans that picture, somehow sees it, even someone at Apple or Google could see it, they can, uh, they can steal your Bitcoin if they have that, that 12 or 24 word phrase. It's best to, uh, to back this up. Maybe you want to put it on steel. There are various devices available for that. You can just Google uh, steel or metal recovery seed or a recovery seed backup. Uh, if you store it on a piece of paper, it's a little bit more risky because it uh, it can then um, be destroyed by water or fire or a tornado or something like this. 
Either way, you're going to have to figure out what works for your best personal situation. Uh, I would recommend definitely wherever you store your recovery seed, whether it's on metal or on paper, store it in a, a tamper-proof bank bag so that you can tell if someone has viewed it. And they look they look like this. Uh, they're these bags that are, are sealable. And once they've been sealed, uh, there's no way to get at what's inside of it. They're not transparent or anything without, without tearing it and showing that it's been exposed. So this is a, a smart way you can put your metal back up in there or you can put your paper back up. I should say what I use to store my Bitcoin is something called multi-sig and there are no keys, there are no hardware wallets, there's nothing uh, at my house. Don't store your recovery seed in a safe deposit box at a bank, uh, especially if it's in a readable form on a piece of paper or a piece of metal like that. And there are a couple of reasons for this. In a true emergency or true crisis, the banks may be closed for weeks or months or even conceivably years in sort of a wartime situation. Someone also could drill into your safe deposit box and steal your recovery seed. This doesn't happen in times of peace, obviously, but do you think after the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the Chinese Revolution of 1949, do you really think that banks followed their protocols and were careful to um, not let anyone have access to their safety, uh, safe deposit boxes? So this is something to consider. And I think banks are probably not, not the best place uh, to store your recovery seed for this for this reason. Now, if you're if you're holding a significant amount of Bitcoin and that that will be something that you'll measure next to your own net worth. So maybe if you have more than call it 10% of your net worth in Bitcoin, then you should probably be using something called multi-sig. Multi-sig just stands for multi-signature. And what it means, if you're if you're using a single sig wallet like a Trezor, that means you just need one signature to transact in Bitcoin, to move your Bitcoin. Multi-sig that means that you need multiple signatures to move your Bitcoin. And it's usually done as an M out of N quorum, they call it. So two out of, you need two out of three keys or three out of five keys to move your Bitcoin. So if you're doing, if you're doing two out of three keys, you would need, uh, call it three hardware wallets, and two of them would be needed at any time to move your Bitcoin. So you could store them in a geographically dispersed area. Uh, not not all of them in one place, certainly not all of them at your house. So I think one way of thinking about this, and this is always a question, how to store your Bitcoin, and it really depends on your personal circumstances and, and how, how much Bitcoin you have relative to your net worth. I think one way of thinking of it is your, if you have, um, call it $5,000 and up worth of Bitcoin, think of this as your savings account or your long-term savings account. This should be stored in multi-sig then maybe your checking account would be for amounts less than 5,000. Again, I'm using checking and savings account as, as metaphors here. Your savings account would be a multi-sig setup with two out of three hardware wallets or three out of five hardware wallets. Checking account would just be a single SIG like we've been talking about in this video, a single treasure or cold card that's backed up by uh, a 12 word recovery seed. And then finally, you can think of what's uh, the cash that's in your purse or in your wallet in your back pocket. Uh, as the as the equivalent of having uh, some Bitcoin on your phone. So maybe you download the Moon app or the Blue Wallet app. Most people, uh, at least that I know, don't walk around with more than a few hundred dollars in their purse or their, their leather wallet. And so these would be sort of the three levels of storing your Bitcoin. There'd be the software wallet on your phone for some really small amounts. There'd be the checking account, maybe for monthly spending in larger amounts. And then there'd be the savings account for uh, really uh, larger amounts of Bitcoin. And again, you don't have to use $5,000 if you're in a country where you make a uh, dollar or five dollars a day. These amounts obviously need to be uh, need to be adjusted down. If you live in a very expensive part of the developed world, these amounts probably need to be adjusted upwards. But I'll let you do that for yourself. Change the numbers to fit your own personal circumstances. I talk more about multi-sig in this video, the best way to store large amounts of Bitcoin, which I will link to below. There are also what are called collaborative custody solutions. CASA, Keys at CASA is one way of doing this where they help you out with the multi-sig and the company itself will hold one or more of the keys, but they'll always hold uh, a few enough keys that they're not able to move your Bitcoin without your permission. So Keys at CASA is one company that does this Unchained Capital, Unchained.com is another one that provides collaborative uh, custody, collaborative multi-sig custody for your Bitcoin. If you want to build your own vault, which is um, what I prefer to do, you can check out my paid course. I'll do a link to it in the description notes below. 
but I think really the gold standard is building your own multi-sig vault. And I call it the DIY multi-vendor multi-sig setup. Basically, you use hardware wallets from multiple different companies, and so there's no overlap. So if all treasures have some, some bug in them that relays the information back to the company, again, I don't think this is true, but if they were, you'd only be using one treasure, and then you'd use a cold card and a, and a ledger or, or something, like, uh, something like that. And again, this would be a do-it-yourself vault. It wouldn't be a collaborative custody solution as CASA and Unchained offer. You'd hold uh, two out of you'd, you'd hold all three keys yourself ge geographically dispersed or all five keys yourself if you're doing three out of five multi-sig in this course i also talk about how to set up hardware wallets the right way how to set up a cold card hardware wallet how to connect it to uh to your own full node and also how to buy and sell bitcoin anonymously as well as how to do coin join and other privacy uh, ways of protecting your Bitcoin privacy. So check out the paid course once you've checked out all my free YouTube videos. And I'll stick a coupon code in the description notes below that will give you $26 off. So you'll get monthly access for just $99 to all my courses, but especially to this ultimate Bitcoin course in which I teach you how to set up your own multi-sig solution. This is really one of the best ways of protecting against an evil made attack. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.